You're in the delivery room and the baby takes its first breath. Instead of a strong cry, you hear grunting and see those little chest muscles tugging in and out. What is going on? The NCLEX wants to make sure you know how to act quickly and correctly to help those tiny little airways. We're going to break this down into the big three, meconium aspiration, respiratory distress syndrome, and transient tachypnea of the newborn. So let's dig in. First, the basics. We need those newborn lungs to adapt to life outside the womb. Inside the womb, they've been taking practice breaths and taking in amniotic fluid. But now on the outside, they have to be able to breathe in air and perform gas exchange. And two key things have to happen. One, we need surfactant. Surfactant is produced to keep those alveoli open. And there's enough produced by 34 to 36 weeks. And the second key thing that must happen is that during labor and vaginal birth, that amniotic fluid has to be reabsorbed and squeezed out of those lungs. Now, if either of these processes is disrupted, we're going to have respiratory distress. Now we're going to be diving into the different conditions soon and learning more about them, but which babies are most at risk for respiratory distress? Well, first we have our preterm babies. So these guys are at risk for respiratory distress syndrome because they're early. They had more time to cook in that oven and they don't have enough surfactant. So especially if they're less than 34 weeks, they are really going to struggle with respiratory distress. And then we have our post-term babies. So these babies are at risk for meconium aspiration syndrome. These guys should have already been born and been on the outside, but now they're overdue and they might have their first poop inside of the uterus. And if they inhale that, it's going to cause meconium aspiration syndrome. And then last is our C-section babies. These kiddos are at risk for transient tachypnea of the newborn, which is definitely the least scary of the three, but it happens when excess fluid is retained and it doesn't get squeezed out of those lungs. And if you have fluid on your lungs, it's hard to breathe. All right, it's time for our first NCLEX quick check. Babies born at what gestation are most at risk for respiratory distress syndrome? Remember, that's our preterm babies less than 34 weeks, and that's because they don't have sufficient surfactant. There should be enough surfactant between 34 and 36 weeks, so you always need to be concerned with your preterm babies about respiratory distress syndrome. Babies born at what gestation are most at risk for meconium aspiration syndrome? That's going to be your post-term babies, which are usually babies over 42 weeks. Remember, they're overdue, and so they might stool in the uterus, and if they inhale it, it's going to cause meconium aspiration syndrome. What respiratory condition is a baby born by C-section most likely to experience? Remember, that's our transient tachypnea of the newborn because of that excess fluid that's sitting on the lungs and doesn't get squeezed out. So first up is our meconium aspiration syndrome. Now, meconium is the newborn's first stool and it is thick, tarry, green, black. If a baby passes this in utero, which can happen because of fetal hypoxia, that meconium can be inhaled. Now, if you had thick tar on lungs, they're not able to expand, right? That thick tar prevents those alveoli from expanding and causes respiratory distress. Now, this is caused, like I said, by fetal hypoxia. So what happens is if the fetus gets hypoxic, we can have relaxation of that anal sphincter, and that's going to cause passage of meconium. And then if they inhale it, that's when we get respiratory distress. So some common causes of this are going to be post-term gestation and placental insufficiency. Now, both of these cause fetal hypoxia because that placenta is not working the way it should be. So with post-term gestation, that placenta has reached its expiration date and that fetus is not getting the blood, oxygen, and nutrients that it needs. And placental insufficiency can happen during labor or towards the end of pregnancy, but either way, that placenta is not getting oxygen and nutrients to that fetus the way that it should. So what can we do to prevent this? We're going to monitor laboring clients for yellow-green amniotic fluid, which indicates meconium. The key here is that we want to identify it early so that we're ready to act. Now, if you notice that yellow-green amniotic fluid, you want to ensure that there's staff trained in neonatal resuscitation present at delivery. All right, so what do we do when that baby is born? Well, what does it mean if that baby is vigorous? Well, it means that they probably did not inhale any meconium and they don't have meconium aspiration. They're crying and active. So in this case, we can just do routine care and put them skin to skin on mom. So what if the baby is non-vigorous. Well, this means that they're limp, they're not crying, they're just hanging there like a dish rag. So if they're non-vigorous, we'll take them to the warmer and prepare for intubation and endotracheal suctioning so that we can clear out those airways. All right, next up is our respiratory distress syndrome. So this is the preemie problem. Remember, surfactant helps keep those alveoli open and there's not enough produced until 34 to 36 weeks. So our cause is likely prematurity from insufficient surfactant being produced or the mom did not get antenatal steroids when she was at risk for preterm labor. I want you to remember that surfactant 
surfactant is the air keeping a balloon inflated. And without it, that balloon's gonna deflate, or in this case, the lungs are gonna collapse. Now, we really wanna prevent this. So if mom is in preterm labor and less than 34 weeks, we're gonna give betamethasone to mature those lungs. So if the NCLEX gives you a question and you have a mom who is 33 weeks with preeclampsia, you need to look for an answer about giving betamethasone to help promote the fetal lung maturity in case she has to deliver early. All right, so what's our treatment after birth? Well, once the baby's born, we can administer surfactant via the ET tube to the newborn. And then of course, we'll provide any respiratory support needed. So oxygen, CPAP, or maybe intubation. Okay, our last of the three is TTN, or transient tachypnea of the newborn. Now, this is the least scary of the three. It's mild, it's temporary, and it's due to extra lung fluid, usually from a C-section without any labor. Labor helps reabsorb and squeeze out that amniotic fluid from the newborn's lungs during birth, just like you're wringing out a wet sponge. So what do we do for TTN? So remember, it's the most mild and it usually self-resolves within 72 hours. So we're just gonna provide supportive care like supplemental oxygen if needed. All right, time for your next NCLEX quick check. What color amniotic fluid indicates meconium? So remember, that's that yellow green color. And if you see it, you wanna make sure that there's trained staff in neonatal resuscitation at delivery. What do you do after delivery when there has been meconium stained amniotic fluid? Well, that's gonna depend. Remember, if they're vigorous, we're gonna do routine care. If they're non-vigorous, they're limp and they're not crying, we'll take them to the warmer and initiate intubation and suctioning. What should you administer to prevent and treat respiratory distress syndrome? Well, we'll give betamethasone to anyone less than 34 weeks at risk or in preterm labor. And we're gonna treat it with surfactant down the ET tube. Now, no matter what the cause, all of these guys are gonna give us some signs and symptoms of respiratory distress. So how do you recognize trouble? Well, you might see an abnormal respiratory rate, right? So normal respirations are 30 to 60 breaths per minute. And it's normal to have periodic breathing or pauses that last up to 20 seconds. But if you start to see breathing that's over 60 breaths per minute or under 30 breaths per minute, or we have these long pauses in breathing that last over 20 seconds, then we're worried about respiratory distress. Next is abnormal breath sounds. If you see crackles on a baby that are persisting past the first few hours, we're concerned about respiratory distress. And of course, any decreased breath sounds. Or these signs of increased work of breathing, grunting, nasal flaring, and retractions. So if a baby is breathing 80 a minute or has pauses in breathing that are over 20 seconds, what do you do? Well, we're gonna stabilize with respiratory support. So we'll clear that airway, suction, give oxygen, and provide CPAP or ventilation. And we're gonna treat the cause. So it's important to understand that infection, hypoglycemia, or cold stress can all increase that oxygen demand and worsen distress. So we wanna make sure that we're preventing and treating any infection, we're monitoring for hypoglycemia, and preventing cold stress by keeping that baby warm. We don't wanna cause respiratory distress or make it worse. And of course, we'll treat our specific causes and give surfactant for respiratory distress syndrome, we'll suction for meconium aspiration, syndrome and we'll give supportive oxygen for TTN. And then we have our supportive care. We'll provide warmth to prevent cold stress. So maybe a radiant warmer or keeping them nice and swaddled. We'll gavage feed them to prevent aspiration. When babies are breathing really, really fast, they're at risk for aspiration. So you never want to PO feed a baby that's breathing fast. And we'll monitor their glucose for hypoglycemia and of course be monitoring their oxygen saturation. All right, time for your last NCLEX quick check. What are three signs of increased work of breathing? Well, that's gonna be grunting, nasal flaring, and retractions. What kind of feedings should be given for a newborn with respiratory distress? Remember, we'll provide gavage feedings. We do not wanna PO feed a baby that's breathing fast and risk aspiration. All right, let's wrap this all up. So first is our meconium aspiration syndrome. Now remember, the babies at risk for this are post-term gestation. They should have already been born, and so they're at risk for fetal hypoxia that can cause meconium to pass in the utero, and then they inhale it, and we have meconium aspiration syndrome. So we wanna make sure that we're monitoring for yellow-green amniotic fluid, and we prepare to suction via the ET tube if they're non-vigorous. Next is our respiratory distress syndrome. So remember, this is a preemie problem. These babies are not born with enough surfactant. Be surfactant to be sufficient between 34 and 36 weeks. So for these babies, we want to administer maternal steroids if they're at risk for preterm labor or in preterm labor less than 34 weeks. And we're going to administer inhaled surfactant to the newborn via the ET tube if they're born with respiratory distress. 
And last up is our TTN, the least scary of the three. And the babies most at risk for this are our C-section babies. And that's because they're at risk for excess fluid being retained on their lungs. So for these babies, it's just gonna be supportive care like oxygen and monitoring their respiratory rate. So no matter the cause, your job is to always stabilize and provide respiratory support like oxygen. And then of course, provide specific interventions to treat the cause. Okay, you're ready for newborn respiratory complications on the NCLEX.